What happened with Resident Evil Zero? It debuted during what is arguably the heyday of the RE franchise. It boasted the same rich resources and design philosophies that were responsible for the series revitalization on the Nintendo GameCube. And yet it remains relatively unknown and unloved. It's difficult to imagine how a game so close in form and function to the beloved Resident Evil remake can be so utterly ignored by fans. Especially when you consider how many shockingly innovative features this prequel actually introduced. But I won't have to imagine for long, because today I'm gonna find out for myself why this game was so overlooked when I complete Resident Evil Zero. Hey everyone, it's Christmas time. You know what that means. Yup, it's time for your favorite YouTubers to do another brand deal for Raid Shadow Legends. This video is brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. With over 400 champions to choose from, with a robust main story campaign, and an arena battle mode, what does this game not have to offer? Well, first things first, it is a turn-based RPG with all different kinds of cool, fun collectibles and items that you can get to help you on your journey to fight through these epic battles. Remember that dragon that everyone has in their trailers? Yeah, he's in this game. There is also a mission challenge mode in which as you complete, you progress to get more items and level up your characters. And when you beat all these missions, you get one of the best champions in the game, the Arbiter, in your arsenal. It's a win-win. you love to see it. Speaking of things to love to see, let's see the dragon one more time. What a majestic creature. The game's free to play. It's on Android and iOS devices. You will get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as a part of the new player program to start your journey. Raid Shadow Legends, check it out. Thanks for watching today's episode of The Completionist, and thanks for supporting the show. Here comes a new challenger! Yeah! Danger! Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. This time around, I'm taking a look at yet another Black Sheep title. But whereas most unpopular franchises entries represent the absolute nader in quality, Resident Evil Zero is almost always regarded as merely middling at worst. But even though it isn't outright hated, Resident Evil Zero is disregarded more often than not. And in order to understand exactly what went wrong, I'm starting my investigation at the point at which everything was going right for Resident Evil. It was March 22nd, 2002, when survival horror was resurrected. After several sequels and a bit of oversaturation in the market, the Resident Evil formula was beginning to wear thin. Until the series was reborn with Resident Evil Remake, it remakes familiar gameplay and settings with fresh mechanics and detailed visuals that are still praised till this day. And it's considered by many as the greatest Resident Evil game of all time. And less than a year later, we got Resident Evil Zero. It shared a lot in common with its predecessor, with both utilizing a modernized version of classic RE gameplay, creating disturbing environments with pre-rendered backgrounds, and taking place in virtually the exact same setting as the other one. And yet, RE Zero hasn't stood the test of time nearly as well. What should have been a guaranteed critical hit instead forced classic RE into retirement, necessitating a drastic shift for the series not long after. Maybe two Nintendo exclusive Resident Evils being released so close to one another was simply too much for players. But one thing is certain, Resident Evil Zero was the death knell of vintage RE. Thankfully, Capcom saw fit to port it, along with Remake, to modern consoles not too long ago, complete with HD overhauls and achievement support. So it's easier than ever for me to revisit RE0 and hopefully understand what happened here. I might be playing it on the PC instead of the GameCube, but for all intents and purposes, it's still the same game, which follows rookie stars officer Rebecca Chambers and the mysterious escaped prisoner Billy Cohen, as they're forced to band together in order to survive the usual Resident Evil threats, unknown environments to explore, cryptic puzzles to solve, and armies of the undead. 
If I'm gonna get to the bottom of this mystery, I figured the best place to start would be examining the differences between this game and the more beloved entries in the franchise. And a few of you might be surprised to learn just how many new ideas Resident Evil Zero actually brought to the table. So when you ask someone if they've played Resident Evil Zero, they'll usually respond with some version of, is that the one with the train? And yeah, yeah it is. But that response isn't that surprising, since most fans probably haven't even made it past that very short section of the early game. Because if they did, I'm sure they'd remember Resident Evil Zero for its legitimately unique features, which are far too enjoyable to be ignored. To address the obvious, there is the fact that the players control two separate characters in what's known as the zapping system. Instead of controlling a solitary survivor like normal, players control both Rebecca and Billy, swapping between them at will. Although this series has dabbled in multiplayer before, this system remains purely single player oriented, just with the two simultaneously playable characters. And that's something that I haven't really seen anywhere else in this franchise. And that's a shame considering how many unique gameplay scenarios can be built around such a simple change. Normally, in Resident Evil, players only have to worry about the enemies who are directly threatening them. But when you have two characters to take care of, you have to balance your attention between them and make sure that neither gets too close to danger, which is an altogether different feeling. Players can even customize how their AI partners behave, choosing between allowing their second character to join the battle with you or sitting fights out entirely so the player can do all of the work. The latter might sound counterintuitive, but sometimes you just want to control exactly how much ammo you are spending. And sometimes the best choice is to just leave your partner behind for a while. In addition to being able to swap between them at any time, you can also split them up at will, which is very useful because if a room is too hairy, sometimes one is better than two. But if you leave your partner in the wrong spot for too long, they can actually get attacked and call you on the radio for help. You can run back to them or switch to that character and need to take care of the business yourself, but either way, you'd better do it fast, because if either character goes down, it's game over. And honestly, hearing someone other than yourself in distress is a new kind of terror I was not prepared for. Of course, there are puzzles which require Billy and Rebecca to cooperate, and even more interestingly, require them to split up. When these moments of forced separation occur, you're compelled to carefully choose which item each one will get, taking full advantage of Resident Evil Zero's item swapping feature. Now, these choices end up really mattering, since there aren't really any inventory upgrades in this game. But I guess it's because having both characters around feels like having 12 item slots at all times. And that might just be the reason Capcom chose to make such a drastic change to the way the items work in Resident Evil Zero. In a truly revolutionary move for the series, there are no item boxes in the game at all. Instead, players can simply drop whatever items they like wherever they are, and they'll simply remain there. It sounds strange when we're all used to the mysterious magic of Resident Evil's item boxes, but that's not how things work here. This makes for a totally unorthodox experience that I'm surprised more Resident Evil titles haven't incorporated. Now, I'm pretty sure this design decision is the reason why this game is a bit smaller in size when compared to the other REs. But honestly, I don't miss the extra length that comes from the obligatory linear, uninteresting lab sections that are always included in these games. They're still here in Resident Evil Zero, but this game is a whole lot cozier in size and it forces the player to backtrack far more often than its cousins. So this might sound unappealing, but this game is built around backtracking and it's encouraged by allowing the player to split the characters up, covering more ground more quickly and by the ability to go back and get the items you've left behind. Admittedly, there were a few times where I was annoyed at having to go back to get something far away like the hook shot. You use this thing once, very early on in the train section, and then you don't need it again except for a couple of more times deep in the late game. But it wasn't that bad since the game intelligently provides a Dark Souls-esque shortcut that links those late game areas to the early locations. It's pretty smart. And going back for items happens pretty often as, even with the added inventory space that comes from controlling two characters, there are plenty of times when players will have to make tough decisions about what items to leave 
and what items to take. Back when Resident Evil Zero was originally being developed for the Nintendo 64, Capcom stated that it was intended to be harder than its predecessors. Maybe that's where all these bizarre choices came from. While I don't think this game is any harder than the other REs, it is a bit more unique with its rewards. Beating the game for the first time will unlock Wesker mode, and no, it's not the usual mercenary shoot em up mode either. It's the Resident Evil Zero campaign all over again, except with Billy being replaced by Albert Wesker. And this mode is utterly fascinating. You get to play as the main man himself, along with a version of Rebecca that's clearly one of Wesker's mind-controlled thralls. Yeah, it's just a skin for her, and we've gotten plenty of skins for our RE protagonists before, but we've never been able to play as altogether different characters before. At least not in the main campaign. This is a first as far as I know, and I had no idea it even existed. While Wesker has the exact same voice actor and dialogue as Billy in these cutscenes, during gameplay, he's his own man, with two unique special moves all his own. He's got a dash that's admittedly hard to control, and it doesn't even stop him from getting grabbed by the ghoulies. But it's undeniably badass looking. And then there's this incredible technique called the Death Stare. This thing can be charged up to three levels, dealing more damage the longer it's held. And it's one of the coolest ways you could ever play through a Resident Evil campaign. Many of us know how cathartic it feels to go back into a game with an infinite rocket launcher, but making people's heads explode just by looking at them has that beat hands down. This mode is an incredible addition that really makes Resident Evil Zero stand out in my mind. Yet this game still has more to give when it comes to one-of-a-kind gameplay. Enter Leech Hunter Mode, which is also unlocked when players beat the game for the very first time. So this one, at first glance, might seem like yet another high-octane, high-score-chasing extra mode, but it's actually more of a look and find. There are 100 leeches hidden throughout the play area, 50 that only Billy can interact with, and 50 for Rebecca, and you have to hunt down as many as you can while taking care of all the monstrosities in your way. Aside from being more slowly paced and exploration focused than the usual RE bonus mode, Leech Hunter also highlights Resident Evil Zero's other unique gameplay aspects. See, you can't discard any leeches after picking them up. Once they're in your inventory, they're there for good. And since they only stack up in sets of 10, both Billy and Rebecca's item slots start filling up pretty fast. Add in all the semi-randomly spawned threats and you've got a bonus mode that's a nice change of pace and a real test of skill. There there were plenty of times when I played through this entire mode, gotten upwards of 90 leeches, only to die at the very end because I had no more room in my inventory for weapons and ammo, leaving myself defenseless. But eventually, I changed my game plan. I cleared out every single enemy first and foremost, while my inventory was leech free and flexible. And when it was all quiet, I went back and picked up all those leeches at my leisure. And for my perfect score, I got some pretty cool unlockables, including an early game game magnum for the campaign, and infinite ammo for every single weapon. So I found Leech Hunter mode a breath of fresh air, and I seriously hope to see things like this in future Resident Evils. Its ability to accommodate collection enthusiasts, speedrunners, and everyone in between means that it can comfortably exist alongside more traditional mercenary modes. I'm just sad that I'm only experiencing it now. Ultimately, I believe that the zapping system and the lack of item boxes stand right alongside laser-sided targets targeting and being hounded by a hulking monster as some of the best RE mechanics. But I can't pretend that Resident Evil Zero is perfect. The game has some features that are true hidden gems, but it's also got glaring issues that most likely kept it from being as highly regarded as the rest of its ilk. So, while plenty of other titles in the Resident Evil series have been, at one time, exclusive to one console, by 2002, the classics were all pretty much widespread due to ports. And then, there was Resident Evil Zero, whose exclusivity certainly didn't help it find a wide audience. And unfortunately, those who did manage to discover Resident Evil Zero may have been quickly turned off by its over-adherence to past formulas and by its inherently flawed premise. That premise, of course, takes place on the night before the 
infamous events of the original Resident Evil. Revisiting much beloved locations and events from new angles is a hallmark of prequel stories. And yet another tenet of prequels is to avoid interfering with or contradicting already established elements by any means necessary. Basically, due to its very nature, there was no way Resident Evil Zero was ever going to have any meaningful impact on the greater Resident Evil mythos. I mean, for example, we know Rebecca is going to make it safely through RE0 since she inevitably has to participate in the events of the first game. But that doesn't mean that she couldn't have had any development at all. Rebecca has no character arc in RE0, which ideally should have been her time to shine. Instead, she's cast as someone who merely reacts to things around her, with no agency of her own, solely defined by her half-baked dilemma about whether or not to turn Billy over to her superiors. Billy himself is tragically even less defined than Rebecca. He has virtually no character development, no personality, and no impact on either this game's story or the overall Resident Evil narrative. As far as I know, no one in this universe ever mentions him again. The only information about him that players are given is a lame backstory that doesn't even come close to making me care about him. As I come to understand how easy it must have been for players to completely forget that Billy exists, I also can't help but wonder why someone like Rebecca's CEO, Enrico, wasn't chosen as her partner. RE0 would have been much more engaging if it had explored their well-established and well-defined dynamic, not to mention retroactively making us care more about his ultimate fate in the original Resident Evil. But even if that were the case, there would still be so many lingering questions due to the very existence of this game. You'd think Rebecca would have more to say to Chris Redfield when they met, considering how she spent the entire previous night fighting off monsters and uncovering critical information about Umbrella's ties to a deadly virus. But no, the events of Resident Evil Zero are never really mentioned ever again, almost like Rebecca herself forgot about them. And if Rebecca can forget, then I can't really blame players for forgetting too. This game's setting and its similarities to the original is also an issue. Although this train is pretty idiosyncratic, the rest of the game's locations feel like a step-by-step -step rehash of RE1, which is particularly egregious since a lot of players back in 2002 had just finished playing the game only a few months before even trying RE0. The majority of the game takes place in this umbrella training facility, which just happens to have a similar layout to a particular creepy mansion that I know it's not one for one, but the similarities are still glaring. And it's not that I dislike this location. It's the best one in the game. It's just that it doesn't help Resident Evil Zero establish its own sense of visual identity. RE2 had the police station. RE3 had the streets of Raccoon City. And even Code Veronica had a prison island and Antarctica to set it apart. RE0, on the other hand, just checks all the franchise's tropes off of the list. Creepy mansion, underground area, industrial location, and a final escape with the race against the clock. There's a reason that this formula worked for so long, but if you stick to it this hard without sufficient innovation, then you're bound to get lost in the shuffle. As stated previously, this game does indeed innovate successfully. The Leishman enemies are great. They're both unnerving in their human-like appearance and novel in their exploding self-defense technique, but some other attempts at innovation just reveal an overall lack of inspiration. I feel like the developers must have eventually lost sight of what makes zombies creepy in the first place. They're a perversion of something that was once safe and familiar, like a man or man's best friend. But insects are already somewhat creepy, and a howling ape is already unsettling. Making one of them giant and throwing battle damage on the other and calling it a day doesn't really terrify me. It's just... Weird, man. All of these criticisms became clearer to me as I continually beat Resident Evil Zero's campaign over and over again. There are a few achievements that task players with beating the game in specific ways, such as without saving, without healing, and of course, by beating it on the hardest difficulty under three and a half hours for that coveted S ranking. So as I was working on getting them all, I understood just how this game went unnoticed. The few fascinating deviations that it did make were simply drowned out by the overly safe and familiar choices. When this game first came out, it was apparently one of the first times that some critics began criticizing the classic take controls as outdated. I think that may have been the first clue that, at the time, this series needed something drastically different from the norm in order to survive.
Although some of the bonuses that players unlock along the road to completion are noteworthy, namely Leech Hunter and Wesker mode, other rewards aren't quite so exciting. First off, there is a gallery mode containing all of the game's cutscenes, which I didn't even know it existed until I had already accidentally filled it in, in its entirety. And yes, of course, there's the rocket launcher for players that obtain an S ranking in the main campaign. But at this point, it doesn't even feel that exciting, partly because of how many times I've wielded it in the past, and more so because of how much more thrilling playing as Wesker is. I can't help but think that if this game had more weird choices like this, and ignored the past a little bit more, then we'd all be more familiar with it. I'm definitely glad to be done with completing Resident Evil Zero, but I feel like I might revisit it someday just to get a chance to try these unique features all over again. While I completed Resident Evil Zero, there were only three deaths. It's simple to stay alive on easy mode, and by the time I got to my repeat playthroughs, I already knew what was around every corner. Four campaigns playthrough. One initial run, one for no saves, one for no healing, and one last time on hard mode. 48 trophies unlocked, with the vast majority of them revolving around the simplest of tasks. 150 leeches collected. That's 100 from the perfect run and 50 more for an achievement that tasks players with collecting all of the leeches of just one color. 18 hours of total playtime. And over 75 heads exploded with Wesker's death stare. Just Wow. What happened to Resident Evil Zero is a shame. It offers some of the most unique takes I've ever seen in the classic Resident Evil formula. And while it does do a lot to offer nice rewards for players, they're just not all that worth the effort, considering how derivative this game actually is. That being said, if you're a genuine fan of the franchise, you owe it to yourself to at least try it out and to never forget that this game actually does exist. So. With that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like the show, do us a favor. Hit that like button. Leave a comment down below on what episodes you want to see on the future of the show. And hey, subscribe. We appreciate the support. Hit the bell to stay up to date on all notifications. I've been Gerard the Completionist, and I'll see you next week for the brand new case. See you later.